Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking some time out of your Thursday afternoon to join us for another educational session. Uh, this month, we're focused on investing in private REITs, which is a new topic I don't think we've ever brought to you before. And um, I'm going to introduce in just a moment our guest speaker for the day. But before we do so, uh, I'm Brittany Bakel, Director of Marketing and Sales. You've typically heard my voice on these sessions. Uh, just a couple notes regarding the webinar. Uh, we slated an hour today. Uh, we hope to take a little bit less than that so that we can leave some time at the end for questions. If you do have questions, you can enter them into the chat box or the question box on the right side panel of your screen. Um, also, so you know, this webinar is being recorded. So if you do have to jump off for any reason or you weren't able to attend live or you know someone who might be interested in seeing this information that didn't join us today, um, we will have a recording sent to you following the session. Um, and then there will be a brief survey, uh, just a few questions at the end of the webinar uh, to gather some feedback from you. And we, we of course, always welcome that. Uh, so with that, let's get started. I'd like to introduce um, our guest speaker, Yen Young, um, CEO of Castoro Group, which is a single family office formed to build and preserve wealth through multi-housing real estate investing. Uh, Castoro grew out of a time-tested, vertically integrated, real estate-focused family enterprise which acquired, managed, and repositioned over a billion dollars in properties. So as CEO, Yen is responsible for the overall leadership of operations, specializing in structuring investments that are suitable, attractive, and efficient for high net worth individuals, family offices, and institutions. With Yen at the helm of Casoro Group, the company successfully achieved over a billion dollars in multifamily transactions. And national publications like the Wall Street Journal and Entrepreneur Magazine frequently feature Yen's expertise in the investment and financial space. Uh, in his free time, he enjoys Batman comics, EDM music, and eating popcorn chips. He also loves to play volleyball and racquetball. So with that, I'd like to introduce Yen, and um, we'll get it started. Thanks for thanks for being here with us today, Yen. Thank you, Brittany. I appreciate that. Um, I also like other comics aside from Batman, but Batman's definitely one of my favorites. Um, Thank you everybody for being on today and taking the time to talk a little bit more about a very favorite topic of mine, which is investing in real estate. Uh, big believer uh, and follower of real estate and uh, really truly believe that it's a great category of investment for, for a lot of folks. Um, give you a little bit of background about our company, uh, Upside Avenue. Uh, we've been around uh, as a company uh, over 16 years now uh, in the real estate field. Uh, we've been able to uh, go through ups and down cycles, and over that time period have been able to do over a billion dollars in transactions, like Brittany had mentioned. Um, specifically, we focus on a, 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 on a niche uh, in the real estate market. Uh, the area that we focus on, we're really a niche of a niche. So when you think about the uh, four major food groups of real estate investing, that would be housing, that would be uh, office, industrial, and uh, commercial, and when you think about, uh, or also known as office, uh, when you think about those four major categories, uh, we focus on housing, and we focus specifically on multi-housing, meaning uh, we look for dwellings where there are more than one family that would live in, in, in that particular uh, real estate. And we'll get a chance today to talk a little bit more about what makes us uh, interesting and why that space is so interesting. So we'll first talk about multifamily and multi-housing in general and give you kind of an idea of some of the benefits of how that sector works and why that's so important. So when you think about your own portfolio and investing, um, a lot of times most people think about publicly traded investments. That's stocks, that's bonds, uh, maybe even to some degree some commodities. Uh, but real estate actually is a, should be a big component where it actually helps you stabilize your portfolio. And there, what we're talking about really is this idea of negative correlations, meaning investing in things that don't move up and down at the same time. They actually might even move opposite of. And real estate can potentially give you that negative correlation, which allows to stabilize the rest of your portfolio. So if you're in stocks and stocks go down, uh, the real estate might be going up or vice versa, and that would help them balance things out. In addition to that, uh, real estate has a very unique feature of being able to generate uh, income. And so what that allows is the ability for you to have an investment that also produces dollars. Because when you're investing in real estate, it's like you're investing in a business. And that business has a net profit. And so with multifamily, we're able to then generate regular or quarterly distributions. 
Uh, the other part of it is that as an asset, what happens over time is that real estate increases in value, and that has uh, historically been true since the, 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 the age of man. Uh, and so when you think about the, the investment into real estate, not only are you able to get money and income during that time period while you're invested, but in addition to that, the, the uh, real estate that you're invested in also increases in value, uh, which grows your principal. And the other thing that's interesting about real estate is that it goes with inflation. So it becomes an inflation hedge, which what that basically means is that if inflation is going up, then the real estate value and the income of that real estate value also goes up so that you don't have to worry about uh, that the dollar is depreciating and the dollars that you're getting are going down uh, because of inflation. This stuff will keep up with inflation. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there could be tax advantages depending on how you invest. Uh, as an IRA, obviously, uh, through next generation, what you'll have is the ability to protect those earnings and not have to pay taxes on those earnings, uh, or they could be tax-free if you decide to do a Roth IRA, and this investment can be inside of that. Uh, so it protects you, like we said, uh, from the stock market swings, uh, but most importantly, it gives you diversification, and through that diversification, you're able to stabilize your portfolio but still get the returns that you need so that you can achieve your own personal goals. Now, when you look at the uh, modern portfolio theory, uh, what you find is that allocation to real estate is a very important piece of the overall pie. And uh, a good statistic to look at is uh, Yale University. So a lot of people uh, follow Yale because Yale has been able to always uh, outperform uh, most endowments and foundations uh, and, and even pension funds, and they are one of the largest. And so a lot of times people are looking to Yale to see what they're doing. Uh, so even within Yale's uh, in, endowment, what they're allocating is 10 to 20 percent of real estate at all times. Uh, there has been times where Yale has actually gone all the way as high as about 35, 40 percent just in real estate. Uh, average, but they're around somewhere around 10 to 20 percent. Uh, they tend to fall right now today somewhere in the 30s. And so that tells you a good indication that they feel very strongly about where the allocation for real estate should be, uh, as well as what they think about that category. Uh, Morgan Stanley also came out with a statistic that talked about the millionaires that are out there. And what you find is that with people who are investors that have over a million dollars, typically 35% of the portfolio was allocated to real estate. So real estate is such a critical part of a portfolio. It shouldn't be the only thing you invest in. Uh, that would be dangerous because it wouldn't give you diversification. But if you're going to diversify your portfolio, it's not just stocks and bonds. Real estate needs to be a part of that, that, that conversation. Now, what is driving uh, multifamily and multi-housing growth? Uh, really, it comes down to the fact that there's a huge increase in the renter population. And what you'll see is a couple of things on this chart, which is a breakdown of how many renters there are by age group. Uh, which is really your breakdown of boomers, millennials, and Gen Z. Uh, when you look at the overall, the statistics are that by the year 2030, we're going to need about 4.2 million new units uh, to be rented out to. And I will tell you that there is a supply and demand gap here, meaning that supply is very high with needing about 4.2 million, and then our actual physical ability to build that fast enough. And so what it allows us to do is actually uh, increase appreciation of this real estate category. The renter, the renter population is expected to grow all the way through till about 2041. And a big part of that is also, also being pushed by the fact that 5 million baby boomers are expected to rent uh, their next residence over by the year 2020, which is only next year. So you're starting to see that the baby boomers are really opting for uh, getting rid of their homes and, uh, and the headaches and, and the amount of energy and management that's required to upkeep a house and really going after more flexibility, uh, more amenities. Uh, you know, they want a pool, but they don't want to deal with the pool. Uh, they want to have a dog park, but they don't want to have to have their own yard to, to deal with. Uh, they want nice amenities to live in, but they don't want to necessarily have to worry about uh, you know, the, the AC going out or the light bulb needs to get changed. And so they're actually one of the biggest renting populations that, that are coming through right now is really the baby boom generation. Uh, and then on top of that, what you find is that millennials 
are also not looking to buy homes. So you're kind of starting to build this momentum around needing multi-housing or apartment complexes because you not only are the baby boomers now coming into the market wanting to, to, to move into apartments, but the millennials are getting slower and slower to buy homes. And partly it's due to several things. You know, one is they're delaying marriages and starting families later. Uh, they want to live in more urban or, or denser areas, uh, and they want to be closer to those amenities and that lifestyle. Uh, they're much more willing to live in smaller spaces, uh, and they also value flexibility. And uh, they, they grew up in, the, in a, an era where they saw the housing collapse uh, of 08 and uh, 09, and so they're not as quick to jump to buying a house and then there's also the issue of affordability because a lot of them have student loans and credit card debt uh, coming out of school, which actually then does not allow them to qualify to buy a home and get a first mortgage. And so the, the effects of this piece of it with the millennials, the effect of the baby boomers, and then you have the Gen, uh, Gen Z uh, coming through, there is just a gigantic amount of demand overall for, for renting space. So if you look at this chart, here, what you see by total population is that you can see that the boom generation was a very big uh, population generation. Gen X kind of went down a little bit, so there was a little bit less uh, population for Gen X. But then you saw the big pickup from millennials. And we just talked about boomers and millennials being the biggest renters, uh, and with Xers being uh, more home homeowners. And so when you look at the two, the two biggest population groups are renters. And then right behind that is Gen Z coming on board. And they're not a small population either. They're not as big as the millennials. Uh, well, you know, not, not by a whole lot, but, but you know, by a million or so. Uh, and when you look at that, what you'll find is that there's going to be this massive influx of new renters that will continue to increase that demand while supply is not necessarily able to match up to that. Now, if we switch gears a little bit and we talk a little bit about listed versus non-traded REITs and what the differences are. So, I think that you can see that the, the need for, for uh, multi-housing is there, uh, whether it's student housing or senior living or just regular families that need it. Uh, we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit more about traded versus non-traded and maybe why you should consider a, a non-traded REIT versus a traded REIT that you can buy over the counter. With non-traded REITs, uh, we have a lot of similarities. Uh, to the uh, uh, listed, uh, what we call publicly traded or listed uh, REITs. Number one is whether you're traded or non-traded, uh, you have to file with the SEC. And why is that important? Well, if you file with the SEC, what that, that means is that in order to be an investment product that the public can feel safe about, it's gone through the stringent uh, underwriting and, and, and due diligence uh, of the SEC. So that gives you a little bit of comfort there. And in addition to that, it also uh, gives you the protection of the SEC so that if there's any mishaps uh, or any sort of Bernie, you know, Bernie Madoff type situation, uh, you know that the SEC is there to back you up. The other thing is that on the uh, reporting uh, standpoint, both listed and non-listed or non-traded uh, performance reporting Still has to be done and has to be available to the public and also it requires a third-party audit and again that should add an additional layer of comfort for the investor uh, so that as you're putting dollars into it you don't have to stress over whether or not the financials have been actually reviewed by third parties and that the fact that the information is out there and available we're both subject to the same IRS regulations uh, and so that is important from the standpoint of that we have to do returns uh, and we have to pay out 90% of our taxable income to the shareholders. So when you invest with us, whether you're, you're uh, which is a non-traded REIT versus a publicly traded REIT, we have to kick out the same income and, and gains uh, as, as they do. And so when you look at our investment, it's not like you would have, we would hold back any returns from you. Uh, we would have to do the same process. Uh, in terms of ability to get into the investment, uh, both have pretty low minimums. Ours is only 2000 uh, but it allows you to be uh, 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 able to get into investments with a, a, a small amount of liquidity. Um, the difference here also is that uh, in terms of liquidity, we provide liquidity uh, so that you can have enhanced liquidity so that 
Uh, although we don't have a daily liquidity like uh, publicly uh, listed uh, REITs, it, we do have uh, uh, enough liquidity where you can get in uh, year in, year out. Uh, the other part is also institutional quality reporting. So what happens is that uh, if you're an RIA or an advisor, we're able to help you with being able to see your clients all through a portal. And so there's the technology piece there. Uh, some key differences of uh, publicly traded versus publicly non-traded. On the non-traded, uh, we are not as susceptible uh, to demand-driven uh, price volatility. And this is important because uh, even though you get a premium for daily liquidity, meaning that you can cash in and cash out uh, every single day, there's a cost to that. And what we're able to do is um, be able to uh, get away from that so that you don't have the same fluctuations uh, on a daily basis as you would on, on the market. And so when you look at uh, publicly traded REITs, uh, their, their valuations change every day and they're fluctuating every day. Whereas a non-listed REIT, what happens is it, the valuations are done on an annual basis and the real estate is evaluated on an annual basis. And what that, that hap what that does is that you don't worry about the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, movement of an apartment complex or an office building. You don't have to worry about that because that day-to-day -day just really has no uh, real bearing to you as an investor. And so what that does is it actually stabilizes your investment because the asset will be there, and then you can do valuations much more uh, on a long-term basis. Now, that is REITs and where we are with uh, traded versus non-traded. I think the next part that we need to talk a little bit more about is what is the investment process here? Uh, because understanding how you do this, this is really where the money is made, if you will. Um, it all starts with access. And what we mean by that is that good real estate deals are not easy to find, nor are they easy to win. And what you have here is that if you are an investor on your own trying to buy an apartment complex, even if you had the capital and you were trying to buy an apartment complex, what will happen is that you may not have the same access as we do into the market. Uh, so we have access to not only the on-market uh, offerings that are out there, and a lot of times the market will contact us because they know we're in that space because we've been in it for a long time, but more importantly, also off-market. And so a lot of times there are deals that will happen and nobody even knows that they've happened. And, and, and those are important because the mix of both on-market and off-market gives you the access to be able to really increase your return so that you find the best deals. Experience is the next part of that, uh, which is that even if you were able and you had the capital to buy an apartment complex, you had the access, how do you operate it? How do you know when you have something good or, or, or something bad? And uh, are you able to then really work the, the, the investment and, and the asset in such a way that allows you to be able to get the most out, most of your money out of the, the property. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times uh, when, you, when you look at the investment, uh, you'll say, okay, well, we'll do some assumptions on how that works. But if your uh, underwriting is incorrect, then what happens is then your assumptions are wrong and the fundamentals of what you're doing for the properties are gonna be inaccurate. So what you anticipate to make money on, you might not be able to, because you don't have all the right inputs in terms of the experience of the team that can say, no, this is how you should look at it or what you should be doing, or no, this is the expectation of the market and how we should underwrite that. So in terms of what we do is we follow what we call a team-based evaluation. Uh, because we're a vertically integrated company, we're able to look at it not only from just the uh, real estate market side, we look at it from also how should we property manage uh, the, the asset. How should we do construction on the asset? What kind of construction makes sense? Uh, how much more rent can we get for that? All of those come in in terms of our ability to then get, provide the investor, you, the most maximum return. And then we follow a very strong due diligence process, which allows us to make sure that we check and balance that. Uh, there's a lot of little nuances when it comes to investing in real estate. Uh, so sometimes you might be looking at a real estate piece of it, but if you don't have the right experts on the ground looking at it, uh, maybe you miss foundation problems, which will end up costing you $100,000 on, on the investment. Or uh, you don't notice that they, uh, their rents are uh, maybe 20% below market and uh, you're not properly managing it right because you're not checking what your, comp your competition and competitors are doing. Um, 
all of those things add up to uh, lost returns on, on an investment. And part of the process is being able to handle all those things so you can maximize that. So specifically to where we are in terms of uh, asset selection and where we buy, uh, we primarily are looking at the Sun Belt area. And that starts uh, from the West Coast minus California and goes all the way across to Florida, Carolina. Uh, and the reason we're looking in those areas is because we focus uh, on areas where there is uh, more population growth uh, and more job growth. And uh, what that allows us to do is that in those sun, what we call the sunnier states, there's been a bigger uh, influx of uh, baby boomers, and uh, there's been a bigger uh, increase in job growth during that time frame. And the employment base is very well diversified. And so the investments that we look for in, in, in our REIT is really going to be focused on those states and cities that, that you see covered there. Now, in terms of uh, uh, category, you probably heard the old adage of location, location, location for, for real estate, and that is true for us as well, too. Uh, but if you look at the type of asset we buy, what we're looking for is location, location, location. But then more importantly, we break that down even further to say, okay, what apartment complexes should we be looking at? Uh, what types of senior living should we be looking at? And what types of student housing? Uh, we're trying to find assets where we can buy at a discount and then try to increase the value uh, to the property so that replacement cost is much higher uh, than the asset that we purchase. So an example of that would be uh, if you find an apartment complex and we look at it and say, you know, they're wanting to sell that apartment complex for $50 million. And we say, you know what, when we look at it, um, $50 million is probably undervalued. They don't realize it, but we do, because they don't realize where their uh, net rent growth could be. Uh, if we put some money in renovations and, and improve the units, we can potentially increase rent. Uh, we can maybe improve on the occupancy of, of those units to make sure that it's full. Uh, and then also maybe we think that the appreciation of the market in that particular location will push the returns overall. The combination of those ideas and thought processes is really what allows us to get the return for you as the investor. And we tend to buy in areas where we can value add, meaning we're not just gonna buy the uh, brand new new building uh, and, 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 and just sit on it and just collect rent. We're looking for opportunities where we can improve the, the investment itself. So meaning that if we put some money into it, uh, we increase the value of the asset, we increase the value of the uh, income that it produces, and overall we have a much higher uh, uh, a sell price later on down the road. That is the strategy and that's the niche that we play. So if you have a chance to want to learn more about uh, Upside Avenue, feel free to visit us at our website, which is upsideavenue.com or send us an email at hello at upsideavenue.com, or you can even call us. Uh, we'll be available. We're uh, a, an office here in Austin, Texas. We're real people. Uh, so uh, we do real estate for a living, and we'd like to be able to extend that opportunity out to you. All right, so with that, I will turn it back over to uh, Brittany and uh, let her uh, talk a little bit more about NextGen. Thank you, Jan. Very informative. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, self-directed IRAs as it relates to utilizing uh, one as an investment vehicle if you're interested in a private re. Obviously, you have the option to invest with personal funds as well, um, but I'm going to talk about some of the advantages of utilizing a retirement plan uh, for this type of investment, and I'll talk a little bit about self-directed IRAs actually for anyone who's not familiar with them. Um, in every crowd, there are, there's always someone that's never heard of this, and I know that it's it seems crazy that it's been around since 1934, and it's just not uh, still not widely known that um, you can utilize IRAs to invest outside the stock market. Um, so I will jump right into it. Um, so as far as the organization itself, just to clarify, Next Generation is not a bank or a brokerage. Um, we are actually custodians and administrators for self-directed retirement plans. And what that means is as custodian, we hold the plan, uh, we hold title to any assets that the plans are invested into, 
on behalf of the IRA owner. And we also do all the record keeping, all the tax reporting, and any other reporting, customer service related to the plan, and all of the transaction processing for investments, whether it's um, investing into a REIT, um, issuing your um, dividends, or taking your investment returns out of your IRA, uh, making withdrawals, deposits, et cetera. So um, we are definitely a financial institution as it relates to that, but we do not, as this disclaimer notes, advise on specific investments. So our goal is to provide education about the rules governing self-directed IRAs, all the different ways you can utilize them, different investment options available to you, and help you understand your role as it relates to doing your own due diligence uh, and kind of uh, managing the activities within a self-directed IRA as well. So just a little bit of background on the company. Uh, we are a privately owned, women-owned business. We've been around since 2004. And our founder and owner is also a real estate broker. She owns a property management company in addition to Next Generation. So she's been very real estate focused her whole life and actually founded the organization out of a desire to put real estate investments into her IRA without really knowing how to do it. And in doing that, she got involved with a network of self-directed IRA administrators and uh, then broke off and formed her own uh, own company. And to date, we hold over $600 million in assets. Um, we are located in New Jersey, but we service and hold IRAs for investors and account holders in every state, even those that live abroad and still have U.S. income that qualify for IRAs can, can hold IRAs with us as well. So the organizational structure, it's comprised of two components. If, if you want to have a self-directed IRA, as I mentioned before, uh, we're custodian and administrator. You have to have both of those components in order to have the IRA um, held. So some companies uh, are just administrators, and they don't have the, um, the ability to custody these plans and their assets. Um, and if that is the case, they do rely on an outside custodian, a third party to do that portion. But we do have everything under one roof. So the difference between these two components, um, just so you understand, is the trust company is the custodian. Um, the trust charter is in the state of South Dakota, where the laws towards self-directed IRAs are most favorable and flexible. So you'll notice a lot of self-directed IRA companies have their charters there. Um, and then we're regulated by their banking commission. Um, regularly audited and required to report to them. And the custodian produces the uh, tax forms for reporting as well. And then the administrative arm, which is Next Generation Services, is the office that I'm out of as well, located in New Jersey. And we provide all the customer service related to the accounts, uh, process any transactions, and uh, basically if you call in with any questions about your account, you're talking to uh, us at the New Jersey office. So as far as what a self-directed IRA is, um, they, they work just like other IRAs as far as tax implications, penalties, contribution limits, if you're familiar with how that all works, then picture it the same, but your available investment options have just been expanded beyond stock bonds, mutual funds, et cetera, to include privately held, non-publicly traded assets. And as Yen touched on earlier, um, very clearly, the one of the advantages of doing that is as a diversification tool to hedge against stock market volatility, right? So if you have all your assets tied up in the stock market and you've seen it's been a roller coaster over the past year, uh, it can make people pretty uneasy, especially if you're getting into your later years, when you really can't afford that kind of volatility but you're not quite where you want to be yet as far as having enough for retirement. This is another tool that allows you to expand beyond that, invest into things that you might have more familiarity with, you might know and understand, uh, have a little bit more control over the decisions that are being made, and also obviously get tax-advantaged investment returns. So with a self-directed IRA, all those earnings from your investment go back into your IRA just as they would if you had it um, in the stock market, right? You don't take personal receipt of it. And when it goes directly back into your retirement account, it remains tax protected. And whether you have a tax deferred or tax free account, like a Roth, 
uh, then your earnings will uh, be subject to, um, you know, either tax deferred or tax free, depending on how long you're going to hold them there. So uh, those are really the benefits, I would say. Um, why this is important, um, and it's becoming more common, I would say, and people are, are looking into it more than they used to, is the retirement landscape is changing. So we're seeing a phase out of those traditional pension plans. Um, social security payments um, are not what they used to be. So it's not enough anymore to just assume and rely on those sources of income for retirement to fill the gap. So not only that, but even when we're controlling our own plans, we have that volatility we talked about. So we are seeing definitely a need to start looking at things a little bit differently and to start for investors to start taking a little bit more control over their own financial futures. And this is one of the tools you can use to do that. So in terms of the types of plans that you can open and then self-direct by investing in non-publicly traded assets, you have your traditional tax deferred IRA, the Roth IRA for tax-free returns, which we talked about a little earlier. If you're self-employed, you can establish a SEP IRA, which allows you to contribute um, higher amounts personally every year, and that's dictated by the IRS. Um, and then some other types of um, employer plans as well, qualified plans like solo 401ks, uh, pension plans for your own business, uh, profit sharing or defined benefit plans can also be established to do self-directed investments. And if you already have one that's in the stock market, um, working with a, your plan advisor, you can potentially create a second component within your existing plan that will allow you to self-direct it. Um, the last two are less common. They're not technically retirement plans, but they are savings plans. Uh, covered else for children's education. You can withdraw those tax-free for education expenses. And then HSAs for uh, medical expenses as well. So ways to get cash to start investing. And as Jen said, depending on what you're doing, you may not need a lot of cash um, in order to make an investment. Uh, you can make a personal contribution uh, for traditionals and Roth. Uh, for this year, it's 6000 uh, And if you're over the age of 50, an additional $1,000 uh, catch-up contribution. If you have an existing IRA that's just invested in the, the market itself, uh, you can take some or all the funds from your existing IRA that might be held at another custodian like Fidelity or, or Schwab, for example, and you can transfer um, amount of funds that you choose uh, once you've liquidated that amount into a cash position to a self-directed IRA that you open. Uh, you can also roll over from an old 401k if you have an old employer plan. It doesn't always have to be a 401k. It could be a 403b, 457, an old pension plan if you worked for uh, the government. Um, anything of that sort, if you're no longer employed and it's eligible to roll over, you can roll that into uh, an IRA and you can utilize those funds as well. And then if you're moving funds from a non-Roth account into a Roth account, you can do that, of course, as well. Just note that's a taxable event and that's what we consider a conversion. And as a custodian, we would work with you once you've established an account to help facilitate getting the funds moved over and the processes that we would work with you on uh, to get that done. So the fun part is what you can invest in. So here are some ideas. Um, as you can see, anything except life insurance and collectibles can be held in an IRA, and that's regulated by the IRS. So real estate is definitely the largest portion that we see in terms of asset class. Probably about 65 to 70% of the assets we hold are, are within the real estate category. Uh, but outside of that, there are other private placements that can be done. Obviously, um, we're talking about private REITs today, so that's one of them. Uh, investing in other startups, um, non-real estate related companies, LLCs, um, forming partnerships, utilizing an IRA, um, hedge funds, precious metals, uh, we have seen some investment in cryptos, uh, not not as much as of late, considering they're not doing so hot right now. Um, but um, it's also uh, popular for people to utilize their self-directed IRAs as a lending tool, as a private lender to another investor or individual, um, essentially just executing a promissory note and then earning interest and principal back into the IRA, which is more of a passive investment as well. So as you can see, there are a lot of ways you can go with this. Um, Basically, the way that you know the, the the money flows, as we said earlier, is that once you uh, open your account and you put the funds in it, you direct your administrator to process an investment on behalf of your retirement account. So you would reach out to us, for example, 
and tell us that you want to invest X thousand dollars into this private REIT. Um, we would review all the documentation associated with that investment, supporting documentation for the fund, uh, the entity, whatever is applicable. And then we do basically a compliance review on all that to make sure that it's in line with IRS guidelines and you're not doing anything that would uh, pose the risk of, of jeopardizing the tax advantage status of your account. So once we've done that review, we will physically send the cash out of your IRA over to the investment. And then when they come back, we would deposit them back into your account for you. So this all sounds great, but there are restrictions that are important to be aware of. Again, regulated by the IRS, and these are the Internal Revenue Code as well. So we don't really see this being an issue with um, investments into larger funds, sort of like what we're talking about today. It's still important to know that you are, if you're using a self-directed IRA, um, not allowed to directly transact with any of these disqualified persons. That's what the IRS has termed them to be. Um, so that means buying an asset from a disqualified person or selling one to, um, basically loaning to a disqualified person or borrowing from one. Um, if you are if you are making an investment and it's directly benefiting any of these people that would be personally compensated for your IRA's investment, that's also not allowed. Um, the IRS is just aiming to basically encourage investments that are benefiting the IRA exclusively and using it as it was designed to be, which is, you know, a retirement wealth building tool for the long run. So as long as you remember that and you consider these rules in mind, um, you won't have an issue, but you do need to understand that the consequences of, of a prohibited transaction are pretty severe. So if one is identified and it can't be corrected with the help of um, you know, counsel or any other resources, then the IRA gets distributed back to the owner as if you took a withdrawal. So as you can imagine, depending on when that happens, um, it could result in pretty hefty penalties and or taxes or back taxes, depending on when the prohibited transaction occurred. So just knowing the rules, um, taking the time up front to be educated, and of course, uh, leaning on uh, your self-directed IRA custodian for that education and support, as well as any uh, financial professionals in your network is definitely a good strategy to take. Um, so if you to um, invest into um, a privately held entity or a private REIT in this instance, um, you some of the things to just note are that related to prohibited transaction rules, um, you can't be an active partner, director, or managing member of that entity. Um, your self-directed IRA can invest as long as you don't have majority um, ownership or if you're already a majority shareholder. Uh, personally, your self-directed IRA would not be able to invest if you had over 50%, but we typically don't see that being the case with these types of investments, but it's just something to note. Um, and of course, if you are earning dividends, um, they, they just as a reminder, get paid back directly to the IRA and not you personally, of course, unless you were taking them out of your IRA, the distribution, and then aware that they would be subject to any you know tax that implies um, or penalties that apply at that point. So if you wanted to do an investment like this, these are the documents that would be needed. So there's a set of internal documents that we, we would send you for you to complete. Um, the bi-direction letter just uh, would literally direct us to purchase the asset that you're looking at for the amount that you note there. And anyone related to the investment you're working with, uh, you can name individuals there so that we could correspond with them as well to collect certain pieces of information. Uh, you'd also want to let us know how you want the funds to be sent out um, from your IRA. And then these private placement instruction letters and advisory notices, one is signed by you and one is signed by a signatory of the entity, just acknowledging that there's an IRA going to invest with them. And then, of course, on the side of the entity you're investing into, supporting documents we'd look at would be operating agreement, if applicable, um, a certificate of good standing for the entity, and then, of course, if you're going to be investing and you execute a subscription agreement or a private placement memorandum, then you would mark those documents read and approved and initial them as the IRA owner. And then we would actually sign them on behalf of your IRA since your IRA is technically the shareholder in this case. So the process for getting everything set up, we get this question a lot. How long does it take? 
Uh, conservatively, I would estimate three to four weeks if you don't already have an IRA set up and funded uh, because you have to complete an application to open a new IRA with a self-directed custodian. And that once your application is signed, we can do everything electronically, but processing is one to two business days. That's pretty quick. Funding the account is really the kind of factor we don't have a lot of control over, and it varies because depending on how you're funding it, if you're transferring from another IRA or rolling over, we need to be aware of the other custodians' requirements and what they need you to do in order for them to release your funds. The world we live in today is very sensitive to security um, and data breaches, and um, I'm sure you know, you know, we've had a lot of issues over the past year or two um, our society in general with regards to fraud and hacks and breaches. So they're very sensitive about making sure that um, they have your full authorization to send funds out of your account. And that's why some of this unfortunately can take some time, but it's for, for safety reasons. And then when you're uh, ready to make an investment, um, you would complete the documentation that we talked about earlier. And then we do that compliance review I talked about, which takes two to five business days, just depending on uh, the complexity of the transaction. And once that's ready to go, we, um, and you would have full access to, full online access to your account to uh, to kind of see where things are at with really regards to your balance. And one of the things I just wanted to talk about that, again, mentioned as well, was valuation of the asset. So uh, right in line kind of with the frequency of valuations for the private REIT, we also collect valuations on an annual basis for alternative assets. Uh, so we will typically reach out to you in the first quarter of the calendar year to collect a value for your IRA as of December 31st, the prior year. And then that's a value that we populate on the tax forms, the 5498, and we send that to the IRS as required on an annual basis. So um, the contact at the asset that you're investing with should be able to provide that value to you. And then that was what we will use to update the value of your IRA. And they can send them to us directly as well. It's just a matter of preference. Uh, so essentially this is the process. Um, I didn't want to get into too, too much detail today, but hopefully you understand the benefit or the, at least considering the option of utilizing a retirement account if you have cash tied up in some plans that you know maybe you don't have personally for investments and you do want to diversify. This is an option to look into. If you'd like more information, uh, you can visit our website. You can shoot us an email. Um, you can also call us, and we're on all social media as well. Uh, we do newsletters. I'm sorry. Yes, newsletters on a monthly basis, but webinars also on a monthly basis, and we typically rotate those topics. So if you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll be aware of all those coming up. Um, and there is a lot of information on our blog as well. So with that, um, I'm going to see if we have any questions here with the time. We have about 15 minutes left. Okay, we do have a question. Let me just, let me just expand the window. Okay, so the question is, why is it an advantage to know the market value once per year instead of daily? A smart investor would not worry about day-to-day -day volatility. <laughs> I guess that might be a question for both of us. Yet. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when you, when you talk about it day-to-day, uh, -day, I think that, yeah, I think a smart investor should know that day-to-day -day valuation and volatility is not part of what they need to do. Uh, I, I think, unfortunately, most investors uh, get into a habit of checking and looking and because of the, the, the daily switching and movement, uh, I think the anxiety and anxiousness starts building in, and uh, and I think uh, I think the listener is correct. I think as an investor, really the lower amount of attention that you pay to day to day valuation um, re really uh, is is not something you want to do. Uh, the nice thing about I think real estate is that you really can't look at a, an apartment building each day and say, well, now the valuation has changed. Uh, so I think that that's actually an advantage of not having to worry about that. Yeah, I agree. I think it's tempting for people to just be sensitive about it because the market is such an emotional thing um, that as long as there is a value being reported on a regular basis, they're, they're just, it's hard to not be affected by that. Um, so yeah, so getting, 
I agree as well that, you know, it, we shouldn't worry about day-to-day volatility, but I think as human beings, it's, it's hard for people to not pay attention to all those fluctuations. Um, all right, so the second question we have here is, can you describe the self-directed IRA fees and where that can be found on the website? Great question. So there's typically a one-time fee of $50 to set up an account. Um, the fee schedule is on our website. If you go to nextgenerationtrust.com under client forms, you'll see everything there, as well as the application documents to open an account. Um, and after the um, initial setup fee, there's an asset administration fee um, that we charge. So again, because we're not advisors, we don't charge advisory fees or anything like that, but our fees are related to the service that we have to provide to the IRA custodian, um, all the reporting statements, um, everything related to uh, record keeping for the account. So we offer two options. Uh, the first option is to just pay a flat rate for each asset in the IRA. So basically each investment that you have, you're into with your self-directed IRA. So the first option, flat fee, is 325 per year. And the second option is an account ba value-based option, which is calculated as a percentage of the total value of the IRA. So that'd be dependent upon any uninvested cash and then value of each of the assets held within it. And that, those percentages range depending on how much you have in there. And it's a sliding scale that basically uh, decreases as the balance increases. Um, it'd probably be easier for me to send out the fee schedule so that you could see that. But essentially, if you have, if you're bringing in more than $30,000 into the account and you're starting out with one asset or one investment in the first year, then the first option, which is that flat fee, is more cost effective. So you can kind of crunch the numbers to figure out which option is more cost effective for you. Um, so those are the general fees. And then depending on what kind of transaction activity is taking place, uh, there are transaction fees that might apply. And so those you can see on the fee schedule as well. And of course, again, those are dependent on what you're doing within the account and how often. Um, so hopefully that answers at a high level. And again, I'm happy to, uh, uh, I have the question askers names here. So I'm happy to send that out to you as well, if you'd like me to email it. Okay, I don't see any other questions. And see if there are any others. Looks like all our attendees are still on. Okay, all right, I think we're good. I don't think we have any other questions. Um, yeah, and any closing remarks? <laughs> No, uh, thank you for the time and I uh, look forward to talking to some folks about uh, real estate and Upside Avenue's offering for that. Excellent. Okay, just as a reminder, everybody will receive a recording of this and um, there, there should be a survey at the end asking for feedback. If you have additional questions, you can feel free to reach out. Thanks so much for your time today and we hope to be in touch with you soon. Have a wonderful afternoon.